All right, now we're ready to tackle the harvesting of energy by cells. And the key event is the oxidation of, the ultimate oxidation of glucose in mitochondria, which uses oxygen to basically burn glucose. Now we could use oxygen to burn sugars and derive energy from them by just lighting sugar with a flame, and sugar will burn. And in the process, it yields a lot of energy. There's a lot of energy stored in the glucose and sugar molecules. But that would be disadvantageous because all the energy would be lost as heat. So the key thing about how cells harvest energy is that they do it in small steps, in small biochemical reactions that alter bonds or oxidize or reduce compounds, and in the process derive energy from the burning of sugar, of glucose. So we're going to study how that occurs in, in, in various biochemical pathways. We can classify organisms into how they obtain energy. Ox autotrophs are, think of plants, they photosynthesize. They derive that they're able to make their own sugars out of energy coming from sunlight in the process of photosynthesis. Whereas heterotrophs need to live ultimately on autotrophs. Heterotrophs use organic compounds produced by other organisms in order to derive energy from them. So a heterotroph might eat another heterotroph, but that other heterotroph would have to derive energy from autotrophs. Or you could have heterotroph eating heterotroph eating heterotroph, but ultimately all heterotrophs derive energy based on photosynthesis by autotrophs. So ultimately the energy comes from the sun, is captured by autotrophs in photosynthesis, and converted to organic compounds that then are used by autotrophs to run their biochemistry, but then can be used by heterotrophs to, um, to derive energy for their biochemical processes. Now, not all organisms, this is a little bit wrong, most organisms use cellular respiration to extract energy from organic molecules. To ba basically to burn their fuel, to burn their food. But um, not all, there are steps prior to respiration, as we will see, that uh, also produce energy and are parts of cellular respiration overall. So we'll examine these separately, these, these different biochemical pathways separately. So respiration is a series of reactions that involve oxidations. We oxidize glucose, we burn glucose. Oxidation is like burning, it's the same thing. When we light a piece of paper and it burns, that's oxidation. We're oxidizing that, um, that paper. If you denied the surrounding environment oxygen, the paper would not burn. You need oxygen to burn um, paper, and you need oxygen to respire, as we will see. Also, we must consider the loss of electrons that occur, called dehydrogenations, when electrons leave compounds accompanied by hydrogen. Hydrogen can carry one electron with it. So that is another, uh, in addition to oxidations and reductions, there are dehydro dehydrogenations that occur in respiration, as we will see. <clears throat> now, during re redox reactions, electrons can carry energy from one molecule to another. We've mentioned this previously. And um, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, NAD, is what we want to remember. NAD plus can, be, can pick up electrons and serve as an electron carrier. And when it picks up two electrons, it becomes NADH. It picks up two electrons and one hydrogen ion, a proton in other words, to become NADH. So this reaction is reversible. These, are, these um, compounds, NAD plus and NADH, are part of a pool of NAD in the cell. And they are recycled back and forth uh, from each other. In the process, there's oxidation and reduction that occurs because when NAD plus accepts, or be when NAD plus becomes NADH, it's accepting electrons. It's becoming reduced. Likewise, NADH can be oxidized and donate electrons to compounds. So here we have this, uh, we can see now. If we can couple NAD uh, reduction and oxidation to biochemical processes. So here, let's say we have an energy-rich mo molecule that binds to an enzyme, and NAD serves as a cofactor uh, to this chemical reaction, to this enzyme. So NAD plus comes in here and is reduced by accepting electrons from this molecule. And then NADH is released. So NAD, has be NAD plus has become reduced. It's accepted electrons. And 
the product has been oxidized, so we oxidized that product moving left to right, and we have donated a hydrogen to solution as well. So we've lost one hydrogen, we've donated that to solution, one hydrogen has been accepted by NAD plus to become NADH, and we have uh, the transfer of electrons, then oxidation of a compound, of this compound here. We can also reduce that compound by um, oxidizing NADH to become NAD plus, and in so doing, transfer electrons to a molecule in the process of reducing that molecule, adding electrons to it. Now here, is, here are the chemical structures for NAD and NADH. And you can see that um, we have added a hydrogen, a proton atom, when, when NADH is reduced to, N, well, I'm sorry, when NAD plus is reduced to NADH, we've added a hydrogen to this aromatic ring here. And um, a hydrogen is donated to solution as well. We start out with NAD plus plus two hydrogen atoms. We don't, one hydrogen, one proton is donated to solution. One hydrogen atom carries um, elect, an electron here and NAD plus gains another electron. And so we have the reduced form of NAD is NADH over here, NADH. Oxidized is over here, NAD plus. This nitrogen is positively charged, that's why it's NAD plus. In the gaining of electrons in the process of reduction, that nitrogen becomes uncharged. So NAD plus, think oxidized, NADH, think reduced. NADH has a positive charge, NADH. NAD plus has a positive charge, NADH has, is neutral. So we shuttle, during respiration, as we will see a little later on, we can shuttle electrons through electron carriers. And these electron carriers will donate electrons to a final electron acceptor, which in aerobic respiration is oxygen. As you know, we breathe in oxygen. So we, we, we respire. We breathe in oxygen. Um, respiration comes to the root word spiritus, which means to breathe. So in aerobic respiration, we're using oxygen as the final electron acceptor, which will then yield water in a long process of energy derivation, as we will see. Whereas anaerobic respiration is an, using an inorganic molecule that's not oxygen. So you don't need oxygen for anaerobic respiration to accept the final electrons in a long chain of electron transfers that are going to produce energy. And in fermentation, the final electron acceptor is not an inorganic molecule or oxygen, but it is another organic molecule. And in fermentation, for example, the uh, alcohol is produced. So we ferment grains to produce ethanol, which we like to drink in wine and, and spirits. So um, these are three processes by which energy can be derived. But er by far, aerobic respiration is the most efficient in terms of yielding energy, the amount, amounts of energy from a given amount of glucose. So per mole of glucose burned, aerobic respiration, as we will see, yields uh, the by far the greatest yield in terms of energy in the form of ATP, which is the energy currency of the cell, as we've already talked about. Now, this illustrates my point about slow energy steps. We, we can transfer electrons, and in the process, they are giving up energy in small steps, giving electrons finally to oxygen to yield water. And this, these small steps of energy release can be used for ATP synthesis. We go from high energy to low energy states, and that energy is harvested to produce ATP. But if we were to burn this all in one single step, most of the energy would be lost, not in the synthesis of ATP, but simply as lost, lost as heat energy. So what biochemistry does, what the catabolic process of respiration does, is to produce um, the rearrangement of chemical bonds and oxidation reduction reactions, both of those, can yield increments of energy release that can be used to drive ATP synthesis. So we have useful energy produced by the slow incremental um, steps of respiration. So let's talk about aerobic respiration. This is the overall reaction, although this occurs in very many small steps, as we shall see. And the total amount, uh, the total delta G here, the loss of free energy in aerobic respiration using oxygen 
as the final electron acceptor to burn uh, sugars like glucose here. It, delta G is minus 686 kilocalories per mole of glucose. So we can derive a lot of energy, 686, almost 700 kilocalories of energy by burning one mole of glucose. Uh, it's very, um, very energy intensive. Uh, we have a very energy intensive yield in aerobic respiration. And this is the minimal values because um, these are the delta G values derived from these compounds being burned by aerobic respiration under standard conditions, which includes um, molar concentrations of reactants, of substrates. But uh, in the cell, this can be e e even yield more energy, as I'll point out later. And as I've said, we must release this in small energy in order to get useful work out of the burning of glucose, get useful work in the form of ATP production. ATP production is the goal of respiration, and energy is released from oxidation reactions in the form of electrons that can be used to drive the synthesis of ATP. And again, to repeat, NAD can be a very important electron shuttler in um, an electron transport chain that we will investigate soon in the next, uh, next few lectures. And the point is, is that ATP, again, can be pr produced by uh, this transporting of electrons in a series of reduction oxidation reactions uh, in the mitochondrion, as we'll, we'll cover. So that's where we'll pick up with next. We'll pick up with the oxidation of glucose and how cells are able to make ATP via substrate level phosphorylation and oxidative phosphorylation. That's where we'll pick up with in just a moment. When we speak of the production of ATP, which is the goal of respiration, to produce the energy currency molecule of the cell and, in high, and produce a molecule with high energy phosphate bonds, as we've discussed, that can then be used, the breakage of those bonds can then be used by enzymes to drive biochemical reactions, reactions that require energy. So we want to produce ATP, that's the goal. We can produce ATP in the oxidation of glucose by substrate level phosphorylation in which phosphate groups are transferred directly to ADP to form ATP and those phosphates come from another molecule. So an enzyme catalyzes that reaction of the production of ATP from ADP by moving a phosphate from another molecule to ADP producing ATP. We call that substrate level phosphorylation because it occurs via an enzymatic reaction that, um, that, uh, that switches a phosphate from one, molecule, from one molecule to ADP to produce ATP. But the second way, and the most productive way to form ATP, is to use oxidative phosphorylation. And in that case, we use an enzyme called ATP synthase. And the energy that is derived from a proton gradient, that is a hydrogen ion gradient, to, to make ATP. And as we will see, this proton gradient across the inner membrane of the mitochondrion allows for the flow of hydrogen ions across the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. And it is that flow, that thermodynamic force of flow of hydrogen ions that will, draw, that will fuel the energy for ATP synthase to manufacture ATP from ADP. So these are two types of phosphorylation events that occur to produce ATP. And as we'll see when we first talk about uh, this process, we'll be dealing with substrate level phosphorylation. So let's first look at substrate level phosphorylation schematically here. And we can see that um, this is an example. The an enzyme takes phosphoenopyruvate, a substance which contains phos a phosphate group, and transfers it. This enzyme catalyzes the reaction of phosphorylation of ADP to produce ATP. So this is an example of substrate level phosphorylation. Now, the complete oxidation of glucose proceeds in stages, and that's where we'll pick up with uh, in the next section.